Welcome, friends, in the holy name of Jesus Christ, to this uh, set video segment of a walk through the Bible study. My name is Robbie Parks, and uh, we'll begin a study today in the Old Testament book of First Samuel. Let me offer a prayer and then a few words of introduction to this book before we take a look at our opening text. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for this word. Illuminate the text in our discussion today by your Holy Spirit, enabling that word to teach us, rebuke us, correct us and train us in righteousness, and to prepare us for every good work. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In our Christian Bibles, the historical books comprise a section of the Old Testament that begins with Joshua and ends with the book of Esther. The book of 1 Samuel was included in that section. The Old Testament Hebrew Bible is uh, similar, although it excludes uh, the books of Ruth and Esther and from the historical section and places them in another section of the scriptures uh, that they call the writings. The content, the organization, and the chronology of the historical section is actually very important. This history follows the last book of the Pentateuch, uh, the book of Deuteronomy, uh, which name means second law. It's interesting because Deuteronomy serves as a preamble and an outline of sorts for the thousand years of history of Israel and its tenure in the promised land. Deuteronomy takes place as the people of Israel have come to the end of their 40 year exile in the wilderness uh, because of their disobedience uh, and unbelief in the Lord that uh, he would bring them safely into the land of Canaan. And as that book begins, the book of Deuteronomy begins, the nation is at last poised and ready east of the Jordan, uh, ready to uh, enter into the land of promise in Canaan. And Moses begins to speak to them and uh, to address them. And he says in a nutshell that uh, he was uh, going to remind them of all that they had learned and of all they experienced, of all that God had already done for them of the law that he had given them to obey when they were on Mount Sinai, of how he promised to bless them if they remained faithful and obedient to him, and of how he also would punish and expel them from the same land if they turned away from him. The historical books of the Old Testament illustrate how God did these things in real time, just as he had promised to do beforehand. Books demonstrate how God actively participated in history, not just Israel's history, but the history of the world. And that active participation of God did not stop with the Old Testament scriptures, but carried forward into the New Testament, where we see God actively participating uh, in, a, in an ultimate level, when he himself became incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ, fulfilling over 300 prophetic pronouncements from the Old Testament. He was live and in person to the people of Israel uh, whom he had made and called for himself. All of that is of the utmost importance for you and me and our faith. In the Bible, we will find the most sublime of all the world's ethical teaching. We'll find rock-solid practical guidance for daily living. We'll find unfathomable philosophical truth and an astounding foresight of prophecy. But we find it all work out in real time, in the real archaeologically verifiable history of our own planet Earth. When we place our faith and our trust in God, we place our faith and trust in the deity that has acted and will act in time and space. 
from the creation of the world and the giving of all life to his final promise of a last day when the Son of Man shall return in great glory and judgment with the Father's holy angels, God has demonstrated that he has worked and is still working out all things according to his will. No other religion in the world can come close to making a claim such as this. In the Old Testament historical book we will, this, we will study now, 1 Samuel, is an important part of that history. The naming of the book for the prophet priest Samuel, who was also the last of Israel's judges, is due primarily to Samuel's prominence. Although it's likely that Samuel was the author of some portions of the book himself, he's described as an old man in 1 Samuel chapter 8, and his death is recorded in 1 Samuel uh, 25. Hebrew scholars have long recognized that Samuel's prophetic su successors, the prophets Nathan and Gad, also participated in the authorship of the historical accounts assembled under the name of 1st and 2nd Samuel, which, for, it, uh, uh, co uh, for by way of explanation in the uh, Hebrew Old Testament, 1st uh, and 2nd Samuel are combined into just one book, uh, named the Book of Samuel. The collation of the historical writings of 1st and 2nd Samuel was completed by the Hebrew scribes during the Babylonian captivity. 1st Samuel and its sequel, 2nd Samuel, are regarded by, by scholars as masterpieces of literature. The subject of 1st Samuel is the intersecting career of three men, the prophet priest Samuel, Saul, the son of Kish, and David, the son of Jesse. These intriguing and charismatic characters and the dramatic storyline of the book notwithstanding, the book of 1 Samuel is consequential primarily because of its chronicling of the establishment of a monarchy in Israel. The book details the rise and fall of Saul as the nation's first king and the preparation of David for his seat on the throne. The historical importance of the book in no way diminishes its theological significance. The name of the book should clue us into the fact that the book has a prophetic point of view. The establishment of the monarchy is mediated by the prophet Samuel. The key issue is how a human king can be accommodated into the framework of the covenant relationship between the Lord Yahweh and his people Israel. According to biblical tradition, God is the king of the universe who rules over his people. And while Israel was in the wilderness, the presence of God's tabernacle in the center of Israel's camp signified his sovereignty over the covenant people. How in the world could Israel have a human monarch without compromising God's kingship? In 1 Samuel, we can find the answer. And that's in the principle that God's king was to be subject to God's prophet through whom the Lord would convey his word. And as it was in Ruth, the unseen hand of God's providence is understood to be the force moving the circumstances, the actions, and the decisions of the key characters in the books of Samuel particularly Hannah, Samuel, and David. We'll see in this book more fibers woven into that scarlet thread of redemption that stretches all the way from Adam down through Boaz, Obed, Jesse, and David to the Lord Jesus Christ. And besides all that, the book of 1 Samuel is just a darn good read. This is a history with an action-packed and dramatic storyline. A, a barren woman is given a child by God, a familiar biblical motif, uh, as we know. A little boy named Samuel, sleeping in the tabernacle of the Lord, is called in the night by God to receive his prophetic summons. The Ark of the Covenant of Israel 
is stolen by the despised Philistines. Samuel anoints Saul as the first king of Israel. A teenage shepherd from Bethlehem named David confronts and kills a Philistine giant named Goliath, and those are the great stories of all time. King Saul becomes insanely jealous of David and tries time and again to have him murdered. And by contrast, there is the devoted friendship of David and Saul's son, Jonathan. We read of David's clandestine wanderings as a refugee from the wrath of King Saul and King Saul's visit to the witch of Endor and so on. And that's just a sampling of what we're in for. So I hope I've whetted your appetite for 1 Samuel. So let's get started by looking at our text. First Samuel 1, verses 1 through 8. There was a certain man of Ramatham Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeraham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival or her tormentor used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not worth more to you than ten sons? The first person we're introduced to in the book of Samuel is Elkanah, the father-to-be of Samuel. Elkanah made his home in a place called Ramatham Zophim, which is later referred to just as Ramah, in the tribal inheritance of the land of Ephraim, about 20 miles north of Jerusalem. It isn't clear whether Elkanah's tribal ancestry was from Ephraim, however. Elkanah's identification as an Ephrathite suggests that he may have been from the region around Bethlehem like Boaz. The extensive demographic information about Elkanah also suggests that he was likely to have been a wealthy man. Text also tells us that Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Penina. This information compounds the likelihood that Elkanah was a wealthy man, since Hannah was described as childless. Heirs were particularly important in Israel, as we saw in the book of Ruth, and a well-to-do man would often take a second wife if the first one was unable to bear children. Polygamy first appears in the biblical record through one of the descendants of Cain named Lamech, in Genesis 4.19, and it was a common custom among many ancient cultures. Many prominent figures in the Bible had more than one wife. However, polygamy was not endorsed by the scripture or by God, and nor is it part of God's design. The, the discord that we will see in Elkanah's family was caused by his polygamy, as it was in the uh, lives of, of others in the, in the Bible. Uh, the, God's design was uh, clearly stated in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, therefore a man, singular, shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, singular, and they 
shall become one flesh. The text says, Elkanah used to go up year by year from his city to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, probably to uh, observe the three annual festivals of the Jews. This practice was good. The Lord's command was th three times a year you shall keep a feast to me. Three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord God. Uh, that's Exodus uh, chapter 23 verses 14 and verses 17. Uh, those feasts uh, would of course uh, be Passover, uh, the uh, Feast of Weeks, and the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. At that time, Shiloh was the central place of Israel's worship, and the tabernacle was erected there. It was, that, it was there that the ministry of the high priest, Eli, and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, took place. There will be much more said about the ministry of these three men in the Lord's tabernacle as we proceed through the book of 1 Samuel. The discussion of uh, giving portions has to do with the feasting that took place following the sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord as described in Leviticus chapter 7. The choice fat portions of the sacrifice were to be presented to the Lord. The remaining portions belong to the worshipers for their feasting in the Lord's presence. We read that Elkanah gave portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. It is stated as fact that Elkanah loved Hannah and it seemed that he felt pain for her because of her deep disappointment in having no children. As Naomi observed in the book of Ruth on her return home from Moab, God is the author of unpleasantness in life as well as blessing. The Lord had closed the womb of Hannah for purposes yet unknown, and she was grieved by it. But what the Lord closes, he can surely open again, and that was surely the force of Hannah's prayers. Sadly, Elkanah's other wife, Penina, was a wicked woman who had no compassion on Hannah and used to provoke her grievously to irritate her. Hannah's heartless tormentor continued to do so year after year as she went up to the house of the Lord. There could not have been any true worship for the Lord in Penina's heart. The woman's scorn was probably exacerbated by Elkanah's love for Hannah and his giving of double portions to her. Hannah was miserable nonetheless, and she wept and would not eat of the sacrificial feast. So Elkanah asked her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? The absence of any answer on Hannah's part may or may not be significant. The text says that Elkanah did love Hannah, and Hannah was undoubtedly a good and loving wife. It will also be shown that she was a righteous and a God-fearing woman. But if it was true that Elkanah had taken a second wife because Hannah had been childless, that had to have hurt may have seemed to Hannah that her husband was perhaps more concerned about his posterity than for her feelings. But God was going to change the fortunes of this broken-hearted woman, Hannah. God delights in working out the course of history through those who may seem to have been cast aside by the world. The Lord founded a nation from an aged and childless woman and her 100-year-old husband. The Lord brought forth his incarnate son from a lowly virgin peasant girl. God is pleased to use the weak things of this world to shame the strong. He hears the cries of the lowly and the righteous, and he delivers them out of all their trouble. Though Hannah felt she was in a pit of despair, 
God was, a, was nearby and he had his strong right hand upon her for good. That is what we will see next time. And until then, may the word of God dwell in you richly and bless you, my friends. Let's pray. Our Father, give us eyes to see your purposes in the unpleasant circumstances of our lives. Enable us to persevere in faith and in prayer through those painful times and to offer ourselves to you in their midst, knowing that you are near us and you hear our cries and you will surely deliver us. We praise you for your great mercy, O God. In Jesus' name, amen.